Chapter One of A Fleet in Being. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. A Fleet in Being by Rudyard Kipling. Chapter One. The sailor men that sail upon the seas to fight the wars and keep the laws and live on yellow peas. A gunroom ditty box g s bowles some thirty of her majesty's men of war were involved in this matter say a dozen battleships of the most recent and seventeen or eighteen cruisers but my concern was limited to one of a new type commanded by an old friend i had some dim knowledge of the interior of a warship but none of the new world in which i stepped from a portsmouth wherry one wonderful summer evening in ninety seven with the exception of the captain the chief engineer and maybe a few petty officers nobody was more than twenty-eight years old they ranged in the wardroom from this resourceful age to twenty-six or seven clear-cut clean-shaved young faces with all manner of varied experience behind them when one comes to think it is only just that a light twenty-knot cruiser should be handled under guidance of an older head by affable young gentlemen prepared even sinfully delighted to take chances not set down in books she was new and they were new the admiral was new and we were all off to the manoeuvres together thirty keels next day threading their way in and out between a hundred and twenty moored vessels not so fortunate we opened the ball for the benefit of some foreign warships with a piece of rather pretty steering a consort was coming up a water lane between two lines of shipping just behind us and we nipped in immediately ahead of her precisely as a hansom turning out of bond street nips in in front of a city bus distance on water is deceptive and when i vowed that at one crisis i could have spat on the wicked ram of our next astern pointed straight at our naked turning side the wardroom laughed oh that's nothing said a gentleman of twenty-two wait till we have to keep station to-night it's my middle watch close water-tight doors then said a sub-lieutenant i say this to the passenger if you find a second-class cruiser's ram in the small of your back at midnight don't be alarmed fascinating game of general post we were then strung out in a six-mile line thirty ships all heading westwards as soon as we found room the flagship began to signal and there followed a most fascinating game of general post when i came to know our signalman on the human side i appreciated it even more the admiral wreathed himself with flags strings of them the signalman on our high little narrow little bridge telescope jammed to his eye read out the letters of that order the quartermaster spun the infantine wheel the officer of the bridge rumbled requests down the speaking-tube to the engine-room and away we fled to take up station at such and such a distance from our neighbours ahead and stern at such and such an angle on the admiral his bow or beam the end of it was a miracle to lay eyes the long line became four parallel lines of strength and beauty a mile and a quarter from flank to flank and thus we abode till evening two hundred yards or so behind us the ram of our next astern planed through the still water an equal distance in front of us lay the oily water from the screw of our next ahead so it was ordered and so we did as though glued into position but our captain took up the parable and bade me observe how slack we were by reason of recent festivities compared to what we should be in a few days now we're all over the shop the ships haven't worked together and station-keeping isn't as easy as it looks later on i found this was perfectly true a varying strain 
one thing more than all the rest impresses the passenger on a queen's ship she is seldom for three whole hours at the same speed the liner clear of her dock strikes her pace and holds it to her journey's end but the man-of-war must always have two or three knots up her sleeve in case the admiral demands a spurt she must also be ready to drop three or four knots at the wave of a flag and on occasion she must lie still and meditate this means a varying strain on all the mechanism and constant strain on the people who control it i counted seven speeds in one watch ranging from eight knots to seventeen which with eleven was our point of maximum vibration at eight knots you heard the vicious little twin screws jigging like restive horses at seventeen they pegged away into the sea like a pair of short-gaited trotting ponies on a hard road but one felt even in dreams that she was being held back those who talk of a liner's freedom from breakdown should take a seven thousand horsepower boat and hit her and hold her for a fortnight all across the salt seas in club and coteries after a while i went to the galley to get light on these and other matters once forward of the deck torpedo tubes you enter another and a fascinating world of seamen gunners artificers cooks marines we had twenty and a sergeant ship's boys signal men and the general democracy here the men smoke at the permitted times and in clubs and coteries gossip and say what they please of each other and their superiors their speech is soft if every one spoke aloud you could not hear yourself think on a cruiser their gestures are few if a man swung his arms about he would interfere with his neighbour their steps are noiseless as they pop in and out of the forward flats they are at all times immensely interesting and as a rule delightfully amusing their slang borrows from the engine-room the working parts of guns the drill-book and the last music-hall song it is delivered in a tight-lipped undertone the more excruciatingly funny parts without a shade of expression the first thing that strikes a casual observer is their superb health next their quiet adequateness and thirdly a grave courtesy but under the shell of the new navy beats the heart of the old all mariette's immortals are there better fed better tended better educated but at heart unchanged i heard swinburne's laying down the law to his juniors by the ash chute chucks was there too inquiring in the politest manner in the world what a friend meant by spreading his limbs about the landscape and a lineal descendant of despart fussed over a four-inch gun that some one had been rude to they were men of the world at once curiously simple and curiously wily this makes the charm of the naval man of all ranks coming and going about their business like shadows not from the admiralty standpoint they were all keenly interested in the manoeuvres not from the admiralty standpoint but the personal many of them had served under one or other of the admirals and they enlightened their fellows as you shall later hear then night fell and our fleet blazed like a lot of chemist shops adrift as one truthfully put it six lights to each ship bewildering the tramps there was a cove of refuge by one of the forward four-inch guns within touch of the traffic to the bridge the break of the forecastle the crowded populations below and the light banter near the galley my vigil here was cheered by the society of a marine who delivered a lecture on the thickness of the skulls of the inhabitants of south america as tested by his own hands it ended thus and so i got ten days in one of their stinkin prisons fed me on grapes they did along with one of their own murderers funny people them south americans oh i hadn't killed any one we only skirmished through their bloomin suburbs looking for fun like fun we've got all the fun we want growled a voice in the shadow 
a stoker had risen silently as a seal for a breath of air and stood chest to the breeze scanning the fleet lights hello what's the matter with your condenser said the marine you'd better take your mucky hands off them ammock cloths or you'll be spoke to our bunkers said the figure addressing his grievance to the sea line are stuck all about like a lot of women's pockets they're stuck about like a lot of bunion plasters that's what our bunkers are he slipped back into the darkness presently a signalman pattered by to relieve his mate on the bridge you'll be hung said the marine who was a wit and by the same token something of a prophet not if you're anywhere in the crowd i won't was the retort always in a cautious don't wake him undertone what are you doing here never you mind you go on to the eye and lofty bridge and persecute your vocation my god i wouldn't be a signalman not for ever so when i met my friend next morning persecuting his vocation as sentry over the life-boy aft neither he nor i recognized each other but i owe him some very nice tales wheeling circling and returning next day both fleets were exercised at steam tactics which is a noble game but i was too interested in the life of my own cruiser unfolding hour by hour to be intelligently interested in evolutions all i remember is that we were eternally taking up positions at fifteen knots an hour amid a crowd of other cruisers all precisely alike all still as death each with a wedge of white foam under her nose wheeling circling and returning the battleships danced stately quadrilles by themselves in another part of the deep we of the light horse did barn dances about the windy floors and precisely as couples in the ballroom fling a word over their shoulders so we and our friends whirling past to take up fresh stations snapped out an unofficial sentence or two by means of our bridge semaphores cruisers are wondrous human in the afternoon the battleships overtook us their white upperworks showing like icebergs as they topped the sea line then we sobered our faces and the engineers had rest and at a wave of the admiral's flag off land's end our fleet was split in twain one half would go outside ireland toying with the weight of the atlantic en route to blacksod bay while we turned up the irish channel to loch swilly there we would coal and wait for war after that it would be blind man's bluff within a hundred and fifty mile ring of the atlantic we of loch swilly would try to catch the black sod fleet which was supposed to have a rendezvous of its own somewhere out at sea before it could return to the shelter of the bay the experts of the lower deck there was however one small flaw in the rules and as soon as they were in possession of the plan of campaign the experts of the lower deck put their horny thumbs on it thus look here their admiral has to go out from black to some rendezvous known only to hisself ain't that so we've heard all that this from an impertinent new to war leaving a cruiser behind em blake most likely or blenheim to bring em word of the outbreak of hostilities ain't that so get on what are you driving at you'll see when that cruiser overtakes him he has to navigate back to black sod from his precious rendezvous to get home again before we intercept the beggar well now i put it to you what's to prevent em rendezvousing out slows in order to be overtook by that cruiser and rendezvousing back quick to black sod before we intercepts him i don't see that his demon's raid is anywhere laid down you mark my word he'll take precious good care to be overtook by that cruiser of his we won't catch him there's a hole in the rules and he'll slip through i know him if you don't the voice went on to describe him the admiral of our enemy as a wily person who would make the admiralty sit up and truly it came out in the end that the other admiral had done almost exactly what his forecastle friend expected 
he went to his rendezvous slowly was overtaken by his cruiser about a hundred miles from the rendezvous turned back again to black sod and having won the game of pussy wants a corner played about in front of the bay till we descended on him then he was affable as he could afford to be explained the situation and i presume smiled there was a hole in the rules and he sailed all his fleet through it we of the northern squadron found loch swilly in full possession of a sou'west gale and an assortment of dingy colliers lying where they could most annoy the anchoring fleet a collier came alongside with donkey engines that would not lift more than half their proper load she had no bags no shovels and her crazy derrick boom could not be topped up enough to let the load clear our bulwarks so we supplied our own bags and shovels rearranged the boom put two of our own men on the rickety donkey engines and fell to work in that howling wind and wet coaling a preparation for war as a preparation for war next day it seemed a little hard on the crew who worked like sailors there is no stronger term from time to time a red-eyed black demon with flashing teeth shot into the wardroom for a bite and a drink cried out the number of tons aboard added a few pious words on the collier's appliances and our bunkers like a lot of bunion plasters the stoker had said and tore back to where the donkey engines wheezed the bags crashed the shovels rasped and scraped the boom whined and creaked and the first lieutenant carved in pure jet said precisely what occurred to him before the collier cast off a full-blooded battleship sent over a boat to take some measurements of her hatch the boat was in charge of a midshipman aged perhaps seventeen though he looked younger he came dripping into the wardroom bloodless with livid lips for he had been invalided from the mediterranean full of malta fever and what are you in said our captain who chanced to pass by the victorious sir and a smart ship he drank his little glass of marsala swirled his dank boat coat about him and went out serenely to take his boat home through the dark and dismal welter now the victorious she is some fourteen thousand nine hundred tons and he who gave her her certificate was maybe ten stone two with a touch of malta fever on him the wardroom disported itself we cleaned up at last the first lieutenant's face relaxed a little and some one called for the instruments of music out came two violins a mandolin and bagpipes and the wardroom disported itself among tunes of three nations till war should be declared in the middle of a scientific experiment as to how the ship's kitten might be affected by bagpipes that hour struck and even more swiftly than pussy fled under the sofa the trim mess jackets melted away the chaff ceased the hull shivered to the power of the steam capstan the slapping of the water on our sides grew and we glided through the moored fleet to the mouth of loch swilly our orders were to follow and support another cruiser who had been already dispatched towards blacksod bay to observe the enemy or rather that cruiser who was bearing news of the outbreak of war to the enemy's fleet it was then midnight of the seventh of july by the rules of the game the main body could not move till noon of the eighth and the north atlantic cold and lumpy was waiting for us as soon as we had put out our lights then i began to understand why a certain type of cruiser is irreverently styled a commodious coffee grinder we had the length of a smallish liner but by no means her dead weight so where the red duster would have driven heavily through the seas the white ensign danced and the twin screws gave us more kick than was pleasant at half past five of a peculiarly cheerless dawn we picked up the big cruiser who had seen nothing stayed in her company till nearly seven and ran back to rejoin the fleet whom we met coming out of loch swilly about one p m of thursday the eighth and the weather was vile 
once again we headed west-northwest in company at an average speed of between thirteen and fourteen knots on a straightaway run of three hundred and fifty miles toward the rocko bank and the lonely rock that rises out of the sea there the idea was that our enemy might have made that his rendezvous in which case we had hope of catching him en masse through that penitential day the little cruiser was disgustingly lively but all we took aboard was spray whereas the low-bowed battleships slugged their bluff noses into the surge and rose dripping like half-tide rocks the flagship might have manoeuvred like half a dozen nelsons but i lay immediately above the twin screws and thought of the quartermaster on the reeling bridge who was not allowed to lie down through the cabin door i could see the decks dim with spray hear the bugles calling to quarters and catch glimpses of the uninterrupted life of the ship a shining face under a sou'wester a pair of sea legs cloaked in oilskins a hurrying signalman with a rolling and an anxious eye a warrant officer concerned for the proper housing of his quick firers as they disappeared in squirts of foam or a lieutenant serenely reporting men and things present or correct behind all as the cruiser flung herself carelessly abroad great grey and slate-coloured scoops of tormented sea about midnight the scouting cruiser same we had left that morning on the lookout for the blake or the blenheim rejoined the fleet but the fleet might have gone down as one keel so far as one unhappy traveller was concerned by noon of july nine we had covered three hundred and twenty five and a half miles in twenty four hours with never a sight of the enemy to cheer us and had reached the limit of our ground here we turned and on a front of twenty four miles from wing to wing swept down two hundred and fifty miles southeastward to the offing of black sod bay mist mercifully the weather began to improve and we had the sea more or less behind us it was when we entered on this second slant about three minutes after the fleet swung round that as though all men had thought it together a word went round our forecastle mist after dinner as they were smoking above the spit kids the doctrine was amplified with suitable language by the forecastle experts and it was explained to me with a great certainty how the other side had outmanoeuvred us by means of the ole in the rules in other words he had been overtook by his cruiser precisely as the wiser heads had prophesied and even at that early stage of the game we had been sold there was no way of finding out anything for sure a big scouting cruiser slipped off again a little before dawn of the tenth and six or seven hours later was reported to be in sight with news of the enemy at this point there came as we learned later what you might call a hitch some unhappy signalman they assert misplaced a flag of a signal whereby it was caused to be believed that a cruiser had sighted the enemy where there was no enemy in that direction then the fleet gave chase and though the thing was abortive the run was a beautiful example of what the new navy can do at a pinch we discovered our mistake then i suppose we discovered our mistake about the enemy and hurried all together for blacksod bay in the hope of cutting him off arrived at the scattered islands near the mouth a cruiser was sent inside to see if any one was at home while the flagship bade the rest of us walk forninster while she considered on it meteorologically the weather was now glorious a blazing sun and a light swell to which the cruisers rolled lazily as hounds roll on the grass at a check nautically there was a good deal of thunder in the air everybody knew something had gone wrong and when the flagship announced that she was not at all pleased with the signalling throughout the fleet it was no more than every one expected now the flagship had some fifty or sixty signalmen and a bridge as broad as a houseboat and as clear as a ballroom our bridge was perhaps four feet broad 
the roar of a stokehold ventilating fan placed apparently for the purpose carefully sucked up two-thirds of every shouted order and between the bridge and the poop the luckless signalman for want of an overhead passage had to run an obstacle race along the crowded decks we owned six signalmen after watching them for a week i was prepared to swear that each had six arms and eight cinder-proof eyes but the flagship thought otherwise i heard what the signalman thought later on but that was by no means for publication high-speed scouting back came the cruiser with news that blacksod bay was empty meantime three other boats had been sent off to reinforce the racing cruiser whose constant business it was to keep touch with the enemy that monster did most of our high-speed scouting and several times at least saw something of the other side we were not so lucky with three second-class friends we were ordered to patrol at twelve knots an hour on a six-mile beat thirteen miles to the northeast of eagle island to fire a rocket if we saw anything of the enemy that night and to stay out till we were recalled when we reached our ground the sea was all empty save for one speck on the horizon that marked the next cruiser also patrolling a desolate and a naked shore broken into barren islands turned purplish-gray in the sunset and two lone lighthouses took up their duty we tramped up and down through that marvellous transparent dusk with more than the regularity of the metropolitan police there was no lawful night but a wine-coloured twilight cut in half by the moon-track on the still water unless the enemy poled in punts under the shadow of the shore and the faint mist that lay along it he could not hope to creep round from the north unobserved the signalmen blessed their gods marine ones that they were away from the flagship the forecastle and my friend the marine assured the signalmen that they would be infallibly hanged at the yardarm when we reached port and we all talked things over forward as the steady tramp continued i told you so he's found a hole in the rules and slipped through it was the burden of our song we must have burned more coal than would ever be expedient in war and we saw imaginary hulls with great zeal till the glorious sunrise cut off from the battle peering over the nettings wet with dew and just as ignorant of events around us as we shall be when the real thing begins End of chapter one chapter two of a fleet in being by rudyard kipling this librivox recording is in the public domain entered suddenly about noon on sunday after the disconcerting fashion of cruisers one of our side flying the general recall and telling us to go down to the flag but when we reached that place we found neither flag nor battleships but the powerful and the terrible who took us under their wing all six of us second and third class cruisers till that point we had been sizable ships but those two huge things dwarfed us to mean little tramps one never gets used to the bulk and height of these berserk campanias then we all began talking who knew anything about anything and who had dragged who round the walls of what our next astern gave us one slate full of information which was rather dizzying that a cruiser at seven thirty that morning had reported to the battle fleet who had spent the night patrolling outside blacksod bay enemy to the westward that the fleet had given chase that the flagship had fired one gun when she came within three miles of the said enemy fifteen miles west of blacksod bay that the enemy had gone into blacksod bay and he believed our own battleships had gone south to bantry i have already explained rudely what the enemy had done that was all we could then arrive at the fleet will learn no more when the real thing arrives i went forward to hear the text commented on sea lawyers said the voice of unshaken experience 
we but add don't tell me we haven't we've intercepted the beggar a young sea lawyer began he was rendezvousing back to blacksod what were the rules anyhow a voice cut in we wasn't fightin rules we was fightin a man i tell you we've been ad didn't i say so when we come round on that long slant from rock all way e's got round us somehow but look here the signals make it out we've won e won't make it out we've won though both sides will claim it that's what they always do when i was in and one went on to tell of other manoeuvres in which he had apparently taken a leading part while we jogged southward behind the powerful as far as the eastern entrance to bearhaven but there were no battleships in bantry bay they had gone on to target practice and presently we cruisers dispersed among the headlands for the same business with orders to rendezvous a few miles south of the fastnet that well-worn mile-post of the transatlantic liner almost infernal mobility no description will make you realize the almost infernal mobility of a fleet at sea i had seen ours called to all appearances out of the deep split in twain at a word and at a word sent skimming beyond the horizon strung out as vultures string out patiently in the hot sky above a dying beast flung like a lasso gathered anew as a riata is coiled at the saddle-bow dealt out card fashion over fifty miles of green table picked up shuffled and redealt as the game changed i had seen cruisers flown like hawks ridden like horses at a close finish and manoeuvred like bicycles but the wonder of their appearance and disappearance never failed the powerful spoke and in ten minutes the cruiser squadron had vanished each ship taking her own matches and sulphur to make a hell of her own and what that hell might be if worked at full power i could presently guess as we swung round a headland and the bugles began at this point the gunner became a person of importance in the navy each hour of the day has its king and the captains of the guns separated themselves a little from the common herd remember we were merely a third-class cruiser capable perhaps of slaying destroyers in a heavy sea but meant for the most part to scout and observe our armament consisted of eight four-inch quick-fire wire guns the newest type two on the forecastle four in the waist and two on the poop alternating with as many three-pounder hotchkiss quick-firers three maxims adorned the low nettings their water jackets were filled up from an innocent tin pot before the game began it looked like slaking the thirst of devils man slaying deviltries we found an eligible rock the tip of a greyish headland peopled by a few gulls the surge creaming along its base and a portion of this we made our target that we might see the effect of the shots and practice the men at firing on a water line up came the beautiful solid brass cordite cartridges and the four-inch shells that weigh twenty-five pounds apiece the little three-pounders as you know have their venomous shell and charge together like small-arm ammunition the filled belts of the maxims were adjusted and all these manslaying deviltries waked to life and peered over the side at the unsuspecting gulls it was still throughout the ship still as it will be when the real thing arrives from the upper bridge i could hear above the beat of the engines the click of the lieutenant's scabbards why should men who need every freedom in action be hampered by an utterly useless sword the faint click of a four-inch breech swung open the crisper snick of the little hotchkiss's falling block and an impatient sewing-machine noise from a maxim making sure of its lock action on his platform over my head the navigating officer was giving the ranges to the rock two thousand seven hundred yards sir two thousand seven hundred yards the order passed from gun to gun ten knots right deflection starboard battery the gun captains muzzled the rubber-faced shoulder pieces and the long lean muzzles behind the shields shifted fractionally try a sighting shot with that three-pounder 
the smack of cordite is keener and catches one more about the heart than the slower burning black powder there was a shrillish gasping wail exactly like the preliminary whoop of an hysterical woman as the little shell hurried to the target and a puff of dirty smoke on the rock face sent the gulls flying so far as i could observe there was not even a haze round the lips of the gun till i saw the spent case jerked out i did not know which of the clean precise and devilish four had spoken when the real thing comes two thousand four hundred the voice droned overhead and the starboard bow four inch quick firer opened the ball again no smoke again the song of the shell not a shriek this time but a most utterly mournful wail again the few seconds suspense what will they be when the real thing comes and a white star on the target the cruiser winced a little as though some one had pinched her before the next gun had fired the empty cartridges cylinder of the first was extracted and by some sleight of hand i could not see the breach had closed behind a full charge a martini henri could hardly have been reloaded more swiftly two thousand three hundred cried the reader of that day's lessons and we fell seriously to work high shriek and low wail following in an infernal fugue through which with no regard for decency the maxims quacked and jabbered insanely the rock was splintered and ripped and gashed in every direction and great pieces of it bounded into the sea two thousand one hundred good shot oh good shot that was a water liner that was the marine's three-pounder good ah ah bad damn bad short miles short who fired that shot a shell had burst short of the mark and the captain of that gun was asked politely if he supposed government supplied him with three pound shell for the purpose of shooting mackerel and so we went on till the big guns had fired their quota and the maxims ran out in one last fiend's flurry and target practice for the month was over the rock that had been grey was white and a few shining cartridge cases lay beside each gun squirting death through a hose then the horror of the thing began to soak into me what i had seen was a slow peddling out of admiralty allowance for the month and it seemed to me more like squirting death through a hose than any ordinary gun practice what will it be when all the ammunition hoists are working when the maxim's water jacket puffs off in steam when the three pounder charges come up a dozen at a time to be spent twenty to the minute when the sole limit of four inch fire is the speed with which the shells and cases can be handled what will it be when the real thing is upon us and the smiling careless faces answered with one merry accord hell every kind of hell but things will happen in ancient days there was an etiquette in sea battles no line of battle ship fired at a frigate unless the latter deliberately annoyed her then she blew the frigate out of the water what will be the etiquette next time suppose a cruiser met a battleship with one set of engines unusable crawling along at eight knots would she jackal the lame thing and tempt her into wasting ammunition it is a risky game to play with sides no thicker than an average tea-tray but under circumstances it might be lucrative would she and a fast cruiser can do this try to rush her by night destroy her fashion at the beginning of the war she might do all sorts of things at the end of it she would take exactly that kind of liberty which experience of the other side's personnel had shown to be moderately safe there is no saying what she could or could not do in heavy weather and navies that do not like heavy weather tumble home boats unused to working in a sea a beaky and a plated navy with big tops that roll and strain might suffer therefore we must pray for foul weather head seas and steep swells gale that bewilders cold that numbs and small fine rain that blinds chills 
and dispirits our men know them men who take their chances under these conditions the possibilities of a good sea-boat are almost illimitable given always the men who know how to handle her the men who will take their chances and as in the army so in the navy runs the unwritten law you must not imperil the property of the taxpayer committed to your charge or you will be publicly broke but if you do not take every risk you can and more also you will be broke in the estimation of your fellows your men will not love you and you will never get on to do him justice the junior officer steers a very fair line between the two councils thanks to our destroyers which give him an independent command early in his career he studies a little ingenuity and artifice they are young on the destroyers the chattering black decks are no place for the middle-aged they have learned how to handle two hundred foot of shod death that cover a mile in two minutes turn in their own length and leap to racing speed almost before a man knows he has signalled the engine-room in these craft they risk the extreme perils of the sea and make experiments of a kind that would not read well in print it would take much to astonish them when at the completion of their command they are shifted say to a racing cruiser they have been within spitting distance of collision and bumping distance of the bottom they have tested their craft in long-drawn channel gales not grudgingly or of necessity because they could not find harbour but because they wanted to know don't you know and in that embroilment have been very literally thrown together with their men enough to sober ulysses this makes for hardiness coolness of head and above all resource you realize it when you hear the dear boys talk among themselves the naval man's experience begins early and by the time he has reached his majority a sub-lieutenant should have seen enough to sober ulysses but he utterly refuses to be sobered there is no case on record of a depressed sub it takes three of him to keep one midshipman in order but the combined strength of the assistant engineer the doctor and the paymaster will not subdue one sub-lieutenant he goes his joyous way impartially and picturesquely criticizing his elders and his betters diverse undulating and irrepressible but when he stands on the bridge at midnight and essays to keep the proper distance in front of the next steel ram dreamily muttering through the water ten knots an hour two hundred yards behind him why then the sub sweats big drops till he gets used to it let us suppose he is third in a line of four that the hour is near midnight and he has been on watch since eight so far we have kept our distance beautifully we have even sneered at the next line a mile away to the right where they have once or twice been all over the shop in twenty minutes there will come relief a bowl of hot cocoa three pulls at a pipe and blessed bed the sub watches the speed lights of the next ahead for as these lanterns change so must he adjust his pace but the next ahead is using up all the basest coal she can find and the wind blows not less than two million samples of it into his straining eyes he has he had the distance absolutely correct he would swear to it the quartermaster by the tiny wheel half heaves up one big shoulder till that moment he has given no sign of life the sub's heel taps impatiently on the planking his mouth hovers over the engine-room voice-tube his lips open to speak to the quartermaster in case in case it should be necessary to sheer out of line for something has gone wrong with the next ahead she has badly overrun her station and shears to the left of our leading ship the sub wipes the cinders out of his left eye and says something now begins the fun now begins the fun the leading ship has slowed a certain number of revolutions say from ten knots to nine and a half but she has not changed her speed lights in time 
we slide out to the right of our next ahead swiftly and quietly and now we must all mark time as it were till our leader straightens herself that which was a line has suddenly become a town on the waters representing roughly three-quarters of a million sterling in value ten thousand tons weight and eight hundred lives our next ahead lies on our port bow and oh horror our next astern is alongside of us heaven send that the captain may not choose this hour to wake the sub has slowed her down to eighty-five but engines are only engines after all and they cannot obey on the instant meantime we can see into the chart-room of her that should have lain behind us a navigating lieutenant sprawled half over the table cap tilted over forehead to keep out the glare of the lamp is poring on a chart we can hear the officer of the watch on her bridge speaking to his quartermaster and there comes over to us a whiff of navy tobacco she is slowing she has slowed with a vengeance and when ships slow too much they lose steerage way and what is far worse they wake the captain this strikes the sub with lurid clearness but the impetus of the recent ten knots is on us all and we are all going much faster than we think again his foot taps the deck are they never going to slow are they never going to slow in the engine-room the pointer on the dial before the quartermaster moves through some minute arc and our head falls off to the left it is excessively lonely on this high and lofty bridge and the spindle-shaped hull beneath looks very unmanageable our next ahead draws away slowly from our port bow and we continue at a safe distance to starboard of her the line is less of a lump and more of a diagonal than it was our next astern is sliding back to where she belongs now two revolutions at a time the sub lets us out till he sees our erring sister ahead return to her place and joyfully slinks in behind her the sub mops his heated brow thanking heaven that the captain didn't wake up and that the tangle was straightened before the end of the watch but speed lights unless properly handled as ours are handled are he doubts not an invention of the devil so also is the fleet so are all cruisers and the sea and everything connected therewith now comes the judgment our leader of course cannot signal back down her line but the signal must be repeated from the leading ship of the line to starboard thus you see we read it diagonally a dull glow breaks out at the masthead of that transmitter of wiggings and a wigging it is for somebody a wigging in drunken winks long and short ones irresistibly comic if you don't happen to be in the service once again we are saved the avenging electric spells out the name of our next ahead a second-class cruiser and then why don't you keep station let us thank god for second-class cruisers and all other lightning conductors the middle watch comes up the sub demands of the stars and the deep profound about him who wouldn't sell a farm and go to sea descends the bridge in one light-hearted streak and three minutes later is beautifully asleep the ship's kitten purring under his left ear but the captain was awake all the time the change of speed roused him and he lay watching the tell-tale compass overhead his mouth at the bridge voice tube one eye cocked through the open port and one leg over the edge of the bunk in case the sub must learn his business by himself must find confidence in isolation precisely as the captain did a quarter of a century ago it is not good for him to know that he is being watched next morning the captain makes a casual allusion to massed fleets in line of sixes and sevens it was our next ahead sir says the sub deferentially yes it was the next ahead when i was a sub is the reply i know that next ahead then the wardroom to whom the sub has been confiding the success of his manoeuvres asks him whether he got to windward of the owner much how the sub gets learning and that is one of the ways in which youth gets learning 
on a big battleship they tell me the sub is little better than the midshipman he despises he lives in the gun-room he goes to school he is sent on errands and if he is good he is allowed to preserve discipline while a fraction of the decks are being washed but on a third-class cruiser he is a watch officer an ornament of the wardroom chapter three of a fleet in being by rudyard kipling this librivox recording is in the public domain apropos of signals to go on where i left off we were to have more than enough of them after target practice we finished first of all the cruisers and went on to our rendezvous the fastnet but if we had listened to the passenger he wanted to lower a boat and investigate the shattered rock we should have been spared many sorrows but we were zealous mr simple and we went to the fastnet and it was hazy and through the haze we heard a horrible elemental moaning that should have warned us the battleships which we had not found at bantry were scattered about those waters at their practice then i remembered that a twelve-inch gun discharges a projectile weighing some eight hundred pounds and ranging about ten miles and we went to the rendezvous encircled by these deep mutterings of invisible monsters and behold we came slap on the flagship who was running torpedoes any other of the big ones would not have mattered but our luck sent us to the flag there was a feeling of calamity in the thick air and i know one man who was not in the least relieved when she signalled where are you bound we replied we were waiting as ordered on the spot for the rest of the cruisers and remained in a deferential attitude while the flagship maintained her horrible composure our fatal mistake thinking no harm we drifted some two miles to leeward which was our fatal mistake though we kept a skinned eye on her presently we saw a signal but end on as flags are apt to be when the signaller is dead up wind and the signalee down we hung our answering pennant at the dip to show that we saw but could not understand and scuttled up to the flagship as fast as might be the first part of the signal was in order to close and the second expressed a desire to speak to us by semaphore our signalmen's faces were studies in gloom about this crisis and the sad moaning of the guns went on afar we learned that the flag had been trying to attract our attention for some time and did not appreciate our negligé de chabillé or words to that effect there is no excuse in the navy and we took what was served out to us by the gibbering semaphore in silence standing at attention to tell the truth we had been rather pleased with our target practice and this sudden dash of cold water chilled us but there is a reason for all things now we must signal the name of the officer of the watch frantic searchings of heart among the officers and the signalman the signalman had got beyond even despair on duty on friday morning last what the nature of their crime was we knew not and it was not ours to ask but later we heard it had something to do with somebody else's error we gave that information the flag could have learned much more if she had asked for it and i effaced myself with a great effacement forward where the wits of the forecastle were telling the signalman of friday morning what sorts of death and disrating awaited him we've lost the game we've lost the game said one man first come first served that shows it and with this dark saying i was forced to be content then the flag removed herself her sixty signalmen her four deep strings of signals and her grim semaphore truly was it written every day brings a ship every ship brings a word well for him who has no fear looking seaward well assured that the word the vessel brings is the word that he would hear anon the cruisers popped over the horizon led by the powerful all save one and the powerful wished to know where that one had gone 
now the rendezvous given us by the powerful could have been read in two ways we all knew how the mistake had arisen and with one exception had all repaired to the place which our leader had in her massive mind but there was no ship of course that could stand up to and gently rebuke the powerful save her sister ship the terrible who signalled politely i suppose the blank is waiting at rendezvous signalled by you to this the powerful stiffly with many flags when ships have any doubt about signal officers should reply not understood the terrible more politely than ever your signal perfectly understood meaning thereby my friend you made a mistake and you jolly well know it we small craft stood back and sniggered while this chaff flew between the two mammoths the thing must have weighed on the powerful's mind for late that evening as we were going home she woke up and began talking about it in flashes from the masthead to the effect that when signals were obviously wrong ships should do something or other laid down in the regulations astonishing the crowded channel traffic but really it made no difference the missing cruiser cast up presently with one funnel blistered and a windsail rigged aft which gave her a false air of being hurried and hot and home we cruisers all went to portland past the wolf and the toothed edge of the sillies astonishing the crowded channel traffic sometimes a jersey potato catch full of curiosity or a full-rigged trader of the deep sea bound for one or other of the capes a norwegian dane german or frenchman and now and again a white-sided brass bejewelled yacht for a few minutes every funnel was in line then one saw the powerful pulling out for a sailing ship and blotting half the horizon with her hull then a second-class cruiser would flicker from the line to starboard all spangled with her masthead her speed helm and sailing lights as the pale glimmer of a fishing smack's lantern crawled out astern of her and now it was our turn to give way that was a royal progress no blind man's bluff off the lizard or dreary game of hunt the needles such as the liners play but through the heavenly clear night the leisurely rolling slow march of the overlords of all the seas hours by right of birth and the whole thing was my very own that is to say yours mine to me by right of birth mine were the speed and power of the hulls not here only but the world over the hearts and brains and lives of the trained men such strength and such power as we and the world dare hardly guess at and holding this power in the hollow of my hand able at the word to exploit the earth to my own advantage to gather me treasure and honour as men reckon honour i and a few million friends of mine forbore because we were white men any other breed with this engine at their disposal would have used it savagely long ago in our hands it lay as harmless as the leaven rods of the Varilla. thus i stood astounded at my own moderation and counted up my possessions with most sinful pride the wind and the smell of it off the coasts was mine and it was telling me things it would never dream of confiding to a foreigner the short hollow channel sea was mine bought for me drop by drop every salt drop of it in the last eight hundred years as short a time as it takes to make a perfect lawn in a cathedral close the speech on the deck below was mine for the men were free white men same as me only considerably better their notions of things were my notions of things and the bulk of those notions we could convey one to the other without opening our heads things one takes for granted we had a common tradition one thousand years old of the things one takes for granted a warrant officer said something and the groups melted quietly about some job or other that same cast of man that same type of voice was speaking in the commissariat in burma in barracks in rangoon under double awnings in the persian gulf on the rock of gibraltar wherever else you please and the same instant obedience i knew would follow on that voice 
and a foreigner would never have understood will never understand but i understood as you would have understood had you been there i went round to make sure of my rights as a taxpayer under schedule d saw my men in my hammock sleeping without shading their eyes four inches from the white glare of my electric heard my stokers chaffing each other at my ash shoot and fetched up by a petty officer who was murmuring fragments of the riot act into my subordinate's attentive ear when he had entirely finished the task at hand he was at liberty to attend to me hope you've enjoyed your trip sir you see i knew what was coming we haven't quite shaken down yet in another three months we shall be something like no ship is ever at her best till you leave her then you hold her up as a shining example to your present craft for that is england my marine the skirmisher in south american suburbs stood under the shadow of the poop looking like a stuffed man with an automatic arm for saluting purposes but i knew him on the human side going off to-morrow ain't you sir well there are only twenty of us here but if you ever want to see the marines a lot of em it might perhaps be worth your while to and he gave me the address of a place where i could find plenty of marines he spoke as though his nineteen friends were no class animals and a foreigner would have taken him at his word a commodious coffee grinder the entire wardroom explained carefully that their commodious coffee grinder must not be taken as a sample of the navy at its best wasn't she a good sea-boat oh yes remarkably so couldn't she go on occasion oh yes she could go but after all she wasn't a patch on certain other craft being only a third-class cruiser practically an enlarged destroyer a tin-pot of the tiniest now in my last ship the captain began that was an unlucky remark for i remembered that last ship and a certain first night aboard her in the long swell of simon's bay when the captain took heaven and earth and the admiralty to witness that of all cluttered up boxes of machinery and bags of tricks his new command was the worst to hear him now she must have been a trifle larger than the majestic with twice the powerful speed we are a deceptive people come and see us next year when we've shaken down a bit said the wardroom and you'll like it better that last was impossible but i accepted the offer our cruiser was about to refit at some dockyard or other in a few days and i gathered that it would be no fault of the captain the wardroom or the warrant officer if she did not arrive with a list of alterations and improvements as long as her mainmast so it was with every new ship the dear boys take her out to see what she can do and in that process discover what she cannot do if by any arrangement or rearrangement of stay stanchion davit steam pipe bridge boat chocks or hatchways she can in their judgment be improved rest assured that the dockyard will know it by letter and voice she never gets more than half of what she wants and so is careful to apply for thrice her needs discontented and impenitent thieves to her just and picturesque demands the yard opposes the suspicion of centuries saying unofficially you are all a set of discontented and impenitent thieves go away the ship considering her own comfort and well-being for the rest of the commission replies also unofficially ah you're thinking of the so-and-so she a nest of pirates if you like but we're good we're the most upright ship you ever clapped eyes on and you're the finest yard in the kingdom you're up to all the ropes there's no getting round you and you'll pass our indents we won't give you any trouble just a few minor repairs and our own people will carry them out don't disturb yourself in the least send the stuff alongside and we'll attend to it and when the stuff comes alongside in charge of a slow-minded understrapper they do attend to it they talk the man blind and dumb sack his cargoes and turn him adrift to study vouchers at his leisure then the first lieutenant grins like a cheshire cat 
the carpenter so called because he very rarely deals with wood the armourer and the first-class artificers sweat with joy and the workshop lays buzz and hum but the understrapper gets particular beans because a great part of his stuff was meant for another ship and she is very angry about it stolen paint late in the afternoon the defrauded vessel sends over a boat to the early and wants to know if she has seen or heard anything of some oak balks a new gangway grating some brasswork and a few drums of white paint why was that yours says the first lieutenant we thought it was ours well it isn't it's ours where is it oh, i'm awfully sorry but i say won't you come and have a drink they come just in time to see the brass rods in position the oak balks converted into some sort of boat furniture the gangway platform receives their weary feet and a fine flavour of paint from a flat forward tells them all they will ever know of the missing drums then they call the first lieutenant a pirate and he poor lamb says that he was misled by the chuckle-headed understrapper who brought the stuff alongside words cannot express the first lieutenant's contrition it is too bad too bad but you know what asses these dockyard chaps can be with soft words and occasional gin and bitters he coaxes the visitors into their boat again for he has studied diplomacy under west african kings they return to their own place being young and guileless and their reception is not cordial their captain says openly that he has not one adequate thief in the ship and that they had better go into the church they should have captured the understrapper early in the day he will speak to the other captain and he does like a brother next time he meets him galley passing galley going to call on the admiral you infernal old pirate what have you done with my paint cries the robbed one me sar not me sar my brother manuel sar that paint my fish done gone finish kerich kogya this from the other potentate the coxswains duck their heads to hide a grin and that is one of the ways they have in the navy see note one the early bird departs with a reputation that would sink a slave dow to try the same trick on hong kong or bombay yard a blissful fortnight this and more oh much more did my friends fore and aft convey to me in that blissful fortnight when i was privileged to watch their labours i heard undilutedly what a boy thinks of punishment and the man who reported him for it how a carpenter regards a dockyard matey what are the sentiments of a signaller towards an admiral and of a stoker towards the authorities who have designed his washing accommodation i overheard in the darkness of beautiful nights fragments of greek drama from the forward flats which it is my life's regret that i cannot make public lectures on all manner of curious things delivered by the ship's jester and totally unveracious reports of conversations with superiors retailed by a delinquent marine fire and collision drill general quarters and the like take on a new meaning when they are translated for you once by the head who orders them and again by the tail who carry them out when you have been shown lovingly over a torpedo by an artificer skilled in the working of its tricky bowels torpedoes have a meaning and a reality for you to the end of your days men live there next time you see the blue ashore you do not stare unintelligently you have watched him on his native heath you know what he eats and what he says and where he sleeps and how he is no longer a unit but altogether such an one as yourself only as i have said better the naval officer chance met rather meek and self-effacing in tweeds at a tennis party is a priest of the mysteries you have seen him by his altars with the navigating lieutenant on the eye and lofty bridge persecuting his vocation you have studied stars masthead angles rangefinders and such all the first lieutenant has enlightened you on his duties as an upper housemaid 
c note one a and the juniors have guided you through the giddy whirl of gunnery small arm drill getting up an anchor and taking kinks out of a cable so it comes that next time you see even far off one of Chapter Four of A Fleet in Being by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was the captain's coxswain, C. Note Two, precise, immaculate, and adequate as ever, who met the returning guest at Devonport a year later, September eighteen ninety eight. This time my cruiser was not with the fleet, but on urgent private affairs a misguided collier had seen fit to sit on her ram for a minute or so in milford haven a few days before and had twisted it thirteen inches to starboard the collier was beached as soon as possible and the admiral he said to us this i got from the coxswain as we drove to north corner by night through the blue-jacketed devonport can you go round to plymouth with your nose in that state lord love you yes said we or words to that effect very good said the admiral then you go this we did at an average speed of sixteen knots through a head sea with a collision mat over our nose same mat we used when we tied up the thresher sir and we ran her up to eighteen point two for a few hours to see how the bulkhead would stand it the carpenter and the carpenter's mate yes they're the same as last year sir sat up to watch but nothing happened and now we're under orders to go back and join the fleet at bantry we've been cruising all round england since august the record of a year once aboard the lugger the past twelve months rolled up like a chart that one needs no longer the commodious coffee grinder welcomed me as a brother for by good luck no one had been changed the same faces greeted me in the little wardroom and we fell to chattering like children had i seen the new fore and aft bridge that we had managed to screw out of the dockyard a great contraption a superior contraption we had worked in a little extra deck under the fore bridge so that now the signalman had a place to stand in which i would remember was not the case last year had i heard of our new coaling record nearly fifty tons per hour which for a third-class cruiser represented four times that amount for a battleship had i heard of the zephyr that blew at funchal of unrecorded evolutions in menorca bay of the first lieutenant's great hall of paint of a recent target practice when nothing was left of the target of the influenza that overtook the steam whistle and a hundred other vital matters the record of a year with the channel fleet was not to be told in two hours but i gathered a good deal ere i dropped into my well-remembered berth that joyous night we departed at noon the next day unhampered by signals a liner leaves plymouth in one style a cruiser snakes out from devonport in quite another which was explained to me on the eye and lofty bridge as we skated round buoy after buoy courteously pulled out a little not to interfere with a yacht race and ran through the brown-sailed plymouth fishing fleet it was divine weather still cloudless and blue and the bridge was of opinion that he who had a farm should sell it and forthwith go to sea our noble selves the cornwall coast slid past us in great blue-gray shadows laid out beyond the little strip of sail dotted blue but my eyes were all inboard considering our noble selves we had accumulated all sorts of small improvements since last year she had shaken into shape as a new house does when one has decided where to put the furniture the first lieutenant as usual explained that we were in no sense clean that twenty ton at least of the four hundred we had just taken in lay about the deck in dust and that it would cost a fortnight to put any appearance on her we're supposed to be burning number two welsh it's road sweepings and soot really that's on account of the welsh coal strike isn't it filthy we smoked out the whole of the fleet and the rock of gibraltar the other day 
but wait till you see some of the others they're worse isn't she a puka pigsty from the landsman's point of view she seemed offensively clean but it is hard to please a first lieutenant ours utilized the delay at devonport to touch her up outside and the perfect weather at bantry to paint her thoroughly inside the only time he left her was to pull round her in a boat and see how she looked from various points of view then i think he was satisfied for nearly half a day rash interest in gun practice over against falmouth we found the sea sufficiently empty for gun practice and went to work at two thousand six hundred yards on the little triangular canvas target all splintered and be patched from past trials this year the three pounders were using up some black powder ammunition and with the wind behind us we were villainously wrapped in smoke but for all that the shots were very efficiently placed on and about the tiny mark one shrapnel burst immediately above the thing and the deep was peppered with iron from above it looked like the cloud wristed hand of a god as they draw it in the dutch picture books dropping pebbles into a pond the more one sees of big gun practice the less one likes it but a big yacht of the r y s thought otherwise streaming down on us of a sudden with all the rash interest of a boy in next door's fireworks she thinks the target is a derelict said the bridge she's coming for salvage she'll be right in the middle of it in a minute no she won't starboard bow maxim there thirteen hundred yards the little demon set up the irritating stammer that the nine point two gun found so objectionable and spattered up the blue all about the canvas as a swizzle stick works up a cocktail our friend turned on her heel with immense promptitude and scuttled to windward later on i heard some interesting tales of craft excursion steamers for choice anchoring between a man-of-war and her target because their captains had heard that there would be gun practice and the passengers at a shilling a head wished to see the fun but they didn't think said my informant that i was the man who'd have been hung drawn and quartered if a life was lost they anchored slap behind the island i was firing at experimental firing at a dummy gun if you please with six inchers twelve pounders and maxims all turned loose together they were angry when we told them to go away out of the strong-shouldered atlantic swell bluer than sapphires rose the double-fanged rock of the fastnet we were close enough to see its steps and derricks and each wave as it shot thirty feet up the rocks the fastnet in fair weather it was like meeting a policeman in evening dress one does not think of the fastnet save as a blessed welcoming wink of light through storm and thick weather big atlantic rollers the irish coast is a never-failing surprise to the big atlantic rollers they trip and ground you can see them check on the shallows fling up a scornful eyebrow and then lose their temper and shape in great lashings of creamy foam that's beerhaven said the bridge indicating an obscure aperture in the jagged coastline we shall find the fleet round the corner the tide's setting us up a little did you ever read the two chiefs of dunboy we shall open dunboy house in a minute round the corner and a half nine sang the leadsman cursing the long-stocked port anchor under his breath for he had to cast to one side of it and it stuck out like a cat's whiskers we were between two rocky beaches split and weathered by all the gales of the atlantic black boulders embroidered with golden weed and barrel bays where the rollers had lost their way and were running in rings behind them the green tiny fielded land dotted with white cottages climbed up to the barren purple hills ah the arrogance here anyhow see her puff the strongest fleet in the world a monstrous plume of black heavy smoke went up to the sky we whipped round a buoy and came on the fleet there were eight battleships alike as peas to the outsider and four big cruisers 
they were not cruising or manoeuvring just then but practising their various arts and crafts the marines fell in on the poop and with bugles and all proper observances we paid our compliments as we ran past the sterns of the cruisers waiting the admiral's word to moor he's given us a billet of our own under his wing too an officer shot down on to the forecastle while the yeoman of signals whose nose is that of a hawk kept an unshut eye on the flag isn't there a four-foot patch somewhere about here said a calm and disinterested voice the navigator having brought her in did not need to wrestle with cables and our anchors with their low cramped davits are no treat we told em about our anchors in the dockyard said the bridge we told em so distinctly and they said we're very much obliged to you for the information and we'll make the changes you recommend in the next boat of your class that's what i call generosity does that ship always behave like that i asked from all three funnels of a high stubby cruiser the smoke of a london factory insulted the clean air oh no she's only burning muckings like the rest of us she's our chummy ship she's a new type she and the furious fleet rams they call em rather like porcupines aren't they the two had an air of bristling hogged-backed ferocity strangely out of keeping with the normal reserve of a man of war the blake long and low looked meek and polite beside them but i was assured that she could blow them out of the water their own captains of course thought otherwise ashore in ireland all ireland was new to me and i went ashore to investigate castleton's street of white houses to smell peat smoke and find dan murphy owner of a jaunting car and ancient friend of the wardroom in this quest me and the navigator mustered not less than half the male population of cork county the remainder being o'sullivan's but we found dan at last old grizzled with an untamable eye voluble and beatifically celtic will i meet you to-morrow at mill cove at nine thirty i will here's my hand and word on it will i drive you to glenbeg for the fishing i will there's my hand and word on it do i mean it don't i know the whole livin fleet man and boy for years he appeared at the appointed hour with a raw-boned horse and wonderful yarns of trout taken by the other gentleman in glenbeg the loch of our desire fourteen miles across the hills it was a cloudless day with a high wind bad for trout but good for the mere joy of life and the united ages of my companions reached forty-five we were quite respectable till we cleared castleton and such liberty men as might have been corrupted by our example then we sang and hung on to the car at impossible angles and swore eternal fidelity to the barefooted damosels on the road they being nowise backward to return our vows and behaved ourselves much as all junior officers do when they escape on holiday it was a land of blue and grey mountains of raw green fields stone-fenced ribbed with black lines of peat and studded with clumps of gorse and heather and the porter-coloured pools of bog-water great island-dotted bays ran very far inland and bounding all to westward hung the unswerving line of atlantic such a country it was as without imagination one could perceive its children in exile would sicken for a land of small holdings and pleasant green ways where nobody did more work than was urgent roaring day of sun and wind at last we came on an inky black tarn shut in by mountains locked and lonely and lashed into angry waves by a downward smiting blast there was no special point in the fishing not even when the sub-lieutenant tried to drown himself but the animal delight of that roaring day of sun and wind will live long in one memory we had it all to ourselves the rifted purple flank of lacawi the long vista of the loch darkening as the shadows fell the smell of a new country and the tearing wind that brought down mysterious voices of men from somewhere high above us 
none but the irish can properly explain away failure we left with our dozen fingerlings under the impression Chapter Five of A Fleet in Being by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. So home, blown through and through with fresh air, sore with hanging on to the car and laughing at nothing, to dine with two cruiser captains aboard one of the big fleet rams. My hosts had been friends since their Britannia days it is this uniformity of early training that gives to the navy its enduring solidarity and one reminiscence leading to another i listened enchanted to weird yarns in which chinese mandarins west coast nigger chiefs archimandrites turkish pashas calabrian counts dignity balls chilean beachcombers and all the queer people of the earth were mingled but it's a lonely life a lonely life said one i've commanded a ship since eighty something and you see how could one help seeing between the after cabins and the rest of the world with very few exceptions lies the deep broad gulf that is only overpassed by sentries signalmen and subordinates entering with reports a light tap a light foot a doffed cap and rounds all correct sir then the silence and the loneliness settled down again beyond the hanging red curtain in the white steel bulkhead herman melville has it all in white jacket but it is awesome to see with bodily eyes sometimes the talk gets serious and the weather-bitten faces discuss how they would work her in a row each delivers his opinion with side digs at his neighbor less heavily armored or more lightly gunned but the general conclusion which i shall not give is nearly always the same it is a terrible power that they wield these captains for saving the admiral there is no one that can dictate to them in the exercise of their business they make their ships as they make or unmake the careers of their men yet mark how providence arranges an automatic check it is in the navy that you hear the wildest and freest adjectives of any service the most blistering characterization of superiors the most genuinely comic versions of deeds that elsewhere might be judged heroic a service of humorists things are all too deadly serious and important for any one to insult by taking seriously every branch of the service is forced to be a humorist in spite of itself and by the time men reach the rank of captain the least adaptable have some saving sense of fun hammered into them a captain remembers fairly well what song the midshipmen were used to singing about the lieutenant what views he held in his own lieutenancy of his commander and what as a commander he thought of his captain if he forgets these matters as in heat on lonely stations or broken with fever some men do then god help his ship when she comes home with a crop of court-martials and all hands half crazy but to go back to methods of attack you can hear interesting talk among the juniors when you sit on a man's bunk of an afternoon surrounded by the home photographs with the tin bath and the shore-going walking sticks slung up overhead they are very directly concerned in war for they have charge of the guns and they speculate at large and carelessly we i speak for our cruiser are not addicted to swearing in the words of the torpedo lieutenant because we do not carry those fittings but we do all devoutly believe that it is the business of a cruiser to shoot much and often see note three what follows is of course nonsense the merest idle chaff of equals over cigarettes but rightly read it has its significance the first thing to do says authority aged twenty-one is to be knocked silly by concussion in the conning tower 
then you revive when all the other chaps are dead and win a victory off your own bat a la illustrated papers wake up in haslar a month later with your girl swabbing your forehead and telling you you've wiped out the whole fleet catch me in the conning tower not much says twenty three those bow guns of yours will stop every shot that misses it and the upper bridge will come down on you in three minutes don't see that you're any better off in the waist you'd get the funnels and ventilators and all the upper fadundlems on top of you anyhow is the retort we're a lot too full of wood even with our boats out of the way the poop's good enough for me says twenty four that is his station fine light airy place and we can get our ammunition handier than you can forward what's the use of that says he in charge of the bow guns you've got those beastly deck torpedo tubes just under you fancy a whitehead smitten on the nose by one little shell you'd go up so'd you she'd blow the middle out of herself if they took those tubes away we could have a couple more four inches there there'd be heaps of room for their ammunition in the torpedo magazine guns and torpedoes we are blessed with a pair of deck torpedo tubes which weigh about ten tons and are the bane of our lives our class is a compromise and the contractors have generously put in a little bit of everything but public opinion except the gunner is unanimous in condemning those dangerous and hampering tubes torpedoes are all rot on this class unless they're submerged two more four inches would be a lot better they're as handy as duck guns i say did you see that last shrapnel of mine burst over the target i laid it myself twenty three looks round for applause but the other guns deride that's all luck says twenty one irreverently mine burst just beyond it would have been dead right for an end on shot it would have sniffed her just on the engine-room hatch sound place that it mixes up the engines mahan says somewhere that broadside firing is going to pay with our low freeboards because most shots go wrong in elevation of course broadside on a shell that misses you misses you clean it don't go hopping along your upper works as it would if you were end on oh i meant my shot for an end on shot of course says twenty one and some one promptly sits on him bearing in a gale no says twenty four meditatively what we really want if we ever go into a row is weather lots of it good old gales regular smellers then we could run in and beak em while it's thick i believe in beaking that belief by the way is curiously general in the navy do you mean to say you'd ram with a tea-tray like ours i'm glad you aren't the skipper i interrupt oh he'd beak like a shot if he saw his chance of course he wouldn't beak anything our size it'd be cheaper to hammer her but take the blank he named a ship that does not fly our flag if you got in on her almost anywhere she'd turn turtle and she cost about a million and a quarter it's just a question of l s d and what'd we do afterwards please ah that's our strong point what happened when that collier drifted down on us at milford it only improved our steaming power didn't it we're a regular honeycomb of compartments forward i believe you could swipe off twenty foot of her forward and she'd get home somehow says an expert enthusiastically bit risky says twenty one that ship you talked of is awfully plated up topside but all her underpinnings are pretty weak if you could lob in a few shell under some of those forward sponsons of hers i believe she'd crumple up with the weight of her own guns but sorrowfully you'd need a nine point two to do that properly beak her beak her catch her in a gale coming out of harbour the speaker named the very port it takes their people a week to get their tummy straight yes but they never come out of harbour at least they didn't in the old days and if they do we shan't be allowed a look in we shall be used for scouting coaling all day and steaming all night but we want those deck tubes taken out all the same 
i'd like target practice every week says another say four times our present allowance of practice ammunition it wear the guns out but it pay and so the talk goes on varying with each ship some of them are all for torpedoes and have submarine vaults the size of a small church devoted to this game but we being what we are are mainly for guns and the gunner who is in charge of the torpedoes has a hard time of it when he runs his quarterly trials a beautiful thing says he as the silver-coloured devil flops from the tube and tears away towards the mark well i'm blowed the torpedo has sheared away to the left and now is poisoning the air with its garlic-scented holmes light fifty yards from the target what did i tell you says some one sotto voce we could have got in a dozen shots from the four inch while you were touching off that boomerang they'd hang you on the blank if you laughed at torpedoes i wouldn't if ours were submerged but with these deck tubes one never knows how they'll take the water that thing must have canted as it fell the gunner looks grieved to the quick but is presently consoled by a few score pounds of gun cotton and goes off with grapnels and batteries to practice sweeping and creeping at the mouth of the bay with a few score other boats they mine and countermine expeditiously in the channel fleet the process is a technical one and need not be described here for there is no necessity to make public either the area covered with mines or the time it took to lay them the gunner returned with a detailed account and some fish that had been stunned by concussion it was a nice little show he said a very nice little show did you happen to see our smoke i had seen one end of bantry bay ripped up from its foundations but did not inquire farther man and arm boats many things are impressive and not a few terrifying in the fleet but the most impressive sight of all is the swift casting forth from the trim black sides of the instruments and ministers of death they vary hourly according to the taste and fancy of the speller a wisp of signals floats from the flagship our little cruiser erupts boils like a hive and some one takes out a watch there is a continuous low thunder of bare feet a clatter always subdued of arms snatched from the racks a creaking of falls and blocks and the noise of iron doors opening and shutting of a sudden the decks stand empty the maxims have gone from the bulwarks and the big cutters are away pulling mightily for the flagship from each one of our twelve neighbors pour forth the silent crowded boats they cluster round the flag are looked over and return they are not merely boats with men in them they are fully provisioned the larger ones have boat guns the smaller maxims with a proper allowance of ammunition and spare parts medical chests and all the hundred oddments necessary for independent action all or any one of them can be used at once for patrol work or for landing parties can be switched off from the main system as a light engine is switched off up a siding each unit is complete and self-contained in ten minutes the boats are back again the maxims replaced the rifles stacked and racked the provisions and water returned to store the ordinary routine of man and arm boats is over landing parties another signal see note four will turn out transport land embark and disembark three thousand armed men with twenty-one field guns in the inside of three hours leaving six thousand men in the ships to carry on if necessary the work of a bombardment or you can vary the program and load a mere thousand or so into eight identical double funneled fifteen knot steam launches one from each battleship and play miniature fleet manoeuvres to your heart's content they are as used to performing evolutions together as are their big parents they can tow half a dozen cutters apiece and work in four feet of water as an experiment you can land your twenty-one field guns with sufficient men to throw up earthworks round them or you can yoke men to the guns and drag them up the flanks of mountains 
or as in mining operations you can turn loose all hell with a string to it pay it out and swiftly drag it back again one never wearies of watching the outrush and influx of the landing parties the swift flight of the boats the minutes check at the beach the torrents of blue and red pouring over the bows and the loose-knit line of mingled red and blue winding away inland among the boulders and heather long practice so perfectly conceals art that the thing presents no points of the picturesque makes no noise calls for no more comment than the set of the waves before a prevailing wind only when you go over certain m s books giving the name station and duties of every man aboard under all conceivable contingencies do you realize how wheel works within wheel to the ordered effortless end superior and adequate persons you can disarrange the clockwork as much as you please but the surviving cogs and ratchets will still go on and finish the job for i do honestly believe that if any accident removed from the fleet every single commissioned officer the warrant and petty officers would still carry on with resource and fertility of invention till properly relieved the public is apt to lump everything that does not carry the executive curl on its coat sleeve as some sort of common sailor but a man of twenty-five years sea experience cool temperate and judgmatic such an one as the ordinary warrant officer is a better man than you shall meet on shore in a long day's march his word is very much law forward he knows his men if possible better than the officers he has seen tried approved and discarded hundreds of dodges and tricks in all departments of the ship at a pinch he can wring the last ounce out of his subordinates by appeals unbefitting for an officer to make by thrusts at pride and vanity which he has studied more intimately than any one else hear him expounding his gospel to a youth who does not yet realize that the navy is his father and his mother and his only aunt jemima go out with him when he is in charge of a cutter listen to him in the workshop in the flats forward between the pauses of practice firing or up on the booms taking stock of the boats and you will concede that he is a superior and an adequate person yes i suppose it's all very nice said one of them while i applauded and admired some manoeuvre that he did not trouble to raise an eyelid for but just think what we could do if we had the men all together for three years steady as it is we're practically a training squadron when we get back to plymouth they'll snatch a hundred of our best men and turn em over to the mediterranean and we'll have to take up a lot of new ones the mediterranean have got the better trained men but they haven't our chances of working together but the men are trained when you get em surely yes but you get the same lot in one ship all through her commission and you put a polish on em p q two cried a signalman that was a well-known message it meant get into your boats as fast as you know how and pull round the fleet the men leaped on to the nettings and fell outboard like dolphins that shows it said the warrant officer with a sniff look at that man crawlin into his place to me he seemed to be flying our first boat ought to be away in fifteen seconds it was quite thirty before the last drew clear there go the arrogance his face darkened was it possible that the tip-tilted hog-backed cruiser had we're well first away said a lieutenant hm we ought to have been more previous said the warrant officer the arrogance nearly beat us we love the arrogant but we do not allow her to lead if we can help it a tale worth telling another time we were not so lucky the tale is worth telling to show a how one is at the mercy of one's subordinates and b how there is no excuse in the navy at odd hours chiefly in the black night the admiral feeling lonely calls up one boat from each ship to his gangway and the signal which we will label t v k reads cutter to flagship from each ship third-class cruisers to send whaler warned by experience the first lieutenant 
whom it is not easy to catch napping had the whaler's crew sleeping all handy by where one order would send them out like fly-stung cattle a cutter requires about three times as many men and on a small cruiser one cannot keep these together enter then at eleven forty five p m a zealous signalman with the words cutter to the flagship in his haste he had omitted to read the conclusion of the signal vouchsafing us the whaler and this was his black error told no one that it was t v k which would have explained the situation no he needs must say cutter so cutter it was after the men had been variously dug out of their hammocks and the heavy boat got away the flagship wanted to know why we were several scandalous minutes behind our time it was a direct reflection on the ship and its smartness a galling and unanswerable wigging that makes men dance and swear with rage we could only have said that the signal was misread which would not have helped us in the least so we shut our mouths and killed the signalman next morning his own chief the hawk-nosed yeoman of signals flung him bound to the executioner saying he ought to have known sir he ought to have known so he was boiled scraped and sandpapered his hair was cut and his number was taken after which he went forward and heard precisely what the lower deck thought of him then a visiting captain's galley hanging on to the gangway rubbed it in gracefully and casually and a fat beef-boat condoled with us ironically and the whaler see note five heard all about it next time she went sailing without an officer in the stern sheets Chapter six of A Fleet in Being by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I had the honor of dining on the flagship next night, and so contagious is the naval spirit that I went there, as it were, annoyed and uneasy over the matter of the misread signal. One cannot regard an admiral in the exercise of his duty as a mere human it is in his power to make you get up an anchor by hand if he thinks you are slack he can stop your coaling and bid you man and arm boats in the middle of the grimy mess he can make you repeat a certain business till you are sick and dizzy or he can raise you to high honour by signalling well done so and so evolution creditably performed he blocks up all the horizon when he appears on it at six miles off across the windy blue the spirit may move him to chat with you and if your best signalman have not his best telescope at his best eye and the admiral be forced to repeat his remarks you will hear about it at closer range the isolation of an admiral the loneliness of a captain is society beside the isolation of an admiral he goes up on the after-bridge and moves some ten million pounds worth of iron and steel at his pleasure no man can stop him few dare even suggest then comes the sea as it did round the orkneys and a little roaring roost marked with a few hair-lines on the chart a tide-rip racing between ledges buffets his stately galleons and drives them lightly out of all formation one never connects a clergyman with st paul but one cannot look at an admiral without speculating on our apostolic succession of the sea with these powers were clothed nelson and the rest admirals all and this particular piece of flesh and blood is of the same order and rank and breed and responsibility the admiral in command of the channel fleet and now it is peace yes i have enjoyed my visit very much thank you sir but if war came to-morrow what would he do how would he think what does he think about now he would go up on the bridge with the flag lieutenant and the ships would be cleared for action no i've never seen a temperly transporter at work and then and then it was a strange dinner for one guest at least with its flowers and crystal and quiet conversation the band playing on deck and the lights of the fleet twinkling all down the bay 
there was a prince in it who was also a flag captain and he set one thinking and there were commanders and lieutenants in it and it was all very pretty and gracious but between me and the menu rose a vision of last year's play war a battleship cleared for action naked and grim like a man swimming with a knife between his teeth a wet and streaming hull thundering through a heavy rain-hammered seas dinner in a gun-room well now you've done that said twenty one suppose you come and dine in a gun-room we have none on the cruiser being all wardroom with a cabin apiece i'll chaperone you to the best disciplined gun-room in the fleet we'll show you so we went twenty one and me to another huge battleship precisely like the admiral's but this time captains commanders and lieutenants were invisible or showed only as superior luminaries far along the decks we dealt with nothing above the rank of sub-lieutenant and the greetings of that grade are cordial and warm down below it was twice the size of our wardroom we found their gun-room which differs in appointments and fittings from everything marryat conceived but i think the old unquenchable spirit persists of the twenty odd inhabitants a dozen at least were midshipmen and therefore as twenty one explained didn't count they talked among themselves in subdued eager whispers dropping into the meal as they came off duty the senior sub-lieutenant quite nineteen years old was responsible for the justly vaunted discipline and it is no small thing to reduce to silence boys of sixteen to eighteen all full of natural and acquired deviltry but it was done according to the custom of the navy and the etiquette of the gun-room whose laws change not midshipmen here the young nelson learns to obey in silence and at a run he has been broken in on the britannia but the gun-room gives him enduring polish the admiral knows a midshipman rather as the almighty knows a black beetle the captain knows him as the head of harrow might know a babe in a perambulator the first lieutenant knows him as the head of the games knows a fag in the lower third but the senior sub-lieutenant of the gun-room knows him as a brand to be snatched from the burning and works over him accordingly in return the midshipman patronizes the admiral at a safe distance is blandly superior to his captain also at a safe distance sings time-honored lampoons about the first lieutenant at a very safe distance but most strictly obeys the senior sub-lieutenant for seven years counting his time in the britannia he dresses at a chest and sleeps in a hammock getting to know himself and his associates with that deadly stark intimacy that only flourishes in the navy there are no excuses in his service he must not answer back and he must do what he is told not immediately but sooner much sooner these are the years that weed out those that have mistaken their calling the incompetents go home and curse the navy evermore the virtuous stay on and learn to steal brass boiler tubes for their boats learn to smoke secretly in the fighting tops they are forbidden tobacco till eighteen fall into and out of all manner of tight places that require dexterity and a cheek of cold-drawn brass pick up more than they learn under the instructor from the talk of the warrant officers and men and the carefully watched mistakes of their elders and when they reach commissioned rank impart their lore to their successors with a dirk scabbard a republic and a despotism if white jacket had not served before the mast what a picture he might have given us of the gun-room it is at once a republic and a despotism the extreme left and the unswerving centre of old tradition individually it is always in hot water collectively it can and does criticise with point and freedom anything and everything on its horizon from fleet manoeuvres to the fit of an instructor's collar pungent merciless indomitable is the gun-room but it preserves discipline the senior sub-lieutenant one could not help thinking of o'brien when he cured peter of the seasickness stuck a fork into the equivalent for a beam overhead ere it ceased vibrating the midshipmen had gone flitting like bats 
had flung themselves backwards from their seats and were through the door that's when we think the conversation might hurt their little morals said my host but they can move much quicker than that make him do it again said twenty one a midshipman three years ago you're getting awfully slack i think what do you do when he presented a contingency oh then we the sub-lieutenant described the course of action with minute particularity adding wouldn't you like to see it done said it to my account that i saved somebody's darling from being butchered to make a gun-room holiday but the midshipmen have an asylum of their own in the schoolroom where i was assured they were worked within an inch of their lives the remnant seemed unusually healthy for when we went out to visit a big smoking concert on the flagship i caught glimpses of limber youths racketing in dumb show round their hammocks not being privileged to have speech with them i asked twenty one what the protective diplomacy of midshipmen might be he gave me to understand that stirring a hornet's nest with the bare toe was tame and pale beside too thoroughly irritating the junior members of the gun-room had himself been concerned in such revolutions we got licked of course he concluded cheerfully but the seniors let us alone after that wasn't it a beautifully disciplined mess though i wish you could see em at sea in weather there's a midshipman he used the other term told off to every scuttle to open it between waves if he lets in any water of course he catches it i had about five years of that sort of thing well now we'll go over to the concert uncle henry's smoking concert said a shrill voice casually are you going to patronize our uncle henry's show to-night i think i ought to i don't want him to think i'm cutting him besides he'd like to meet one zealous and efficient officer it'd cheer him up i whipped round to see two small boys of blank countenances studying the deck beams it was humanly conceivable that uncle henry might be the admiral's nickname but could two midshipmen i fled lest the ship should blow up under me and left those zealous and efficient ones to their dignity imagine a quarter-deck seventy-five feet wide and a hundred and twenty feet long awninged over decked with flags and a triple row of white and purple electrics the massed bands of the fleet at the far end and all the rest from the stern to the snowy barbette a whirl of uniforms of all ranks captains with and without aiguillettes commanders officers of marine in their blue-faced mess-jackets with the laurelled globe on the lapel engineers paymasters clerks and the others a shifting carpet of blue and gold and red and black the muzzles of the forty-six ton guns sheered up above us and high over all on the top of the barbette which was disguised with flags and carpets sat the admiral it was an amazing spectacle the fleet at play and for some reason it made me choke one recovered here men last met at the other end of the world at gaspe bermuda vancouver yokohama invercargill or bombay rovers and rangers in her majesty's men-of-war then we danced for this also is the custom of the navy that when a man has been working like several niggers all day he should on chance given dance and that is why the naval man dances so well he begins as i have seen on the britannia whose decks are fairly open then he dances on such occasions as these in and out among all the fittings of a battleship's deck makes us awfully handy with our feet said twenty one mopping himself in the pauses of a waltz won't you take a turn no end good exercise no i'm afraid of the ladies i replied they are rather solid said twenty one reflectively as a post captain reversed on to his toes my partner doesn't protect me as a gentleman should he threw me at a paymaster just now how in the course of their work they had saved up enough energy for this diversion was beyond me they danced fair heel and toe unsparingly a couple of hours for the sheer downright exercise of it and they were by no means all youths in the game either we dropped panting into the boats and saw behind us the whole gay show fade flicker and twinkle out the flagship had returned to her ordinary business 
to-morrow she would take us back to portland on our speed trials number two welsh coal isn't it scandalous isn't it perfectly damnable said an officer after we had got under way pointing to the foul greasy columns of smoke that poured from every funnel her majesty's channel squadron if you please under steam burning horse dung truthfully it was a sickening sight we could have been seen thirty miles off a curtain of cloud spangled and speckled with bits of burning rubbish and lumps of muck the first lieutenant looked at the beach of clinkers piling up on his hammock nettings and blessed the principality of wales the chief engineer merely said you never know your luck in the navy put on his most ancient kit and was no more seen in the likeness of a christian man fate had hit him hard for just as his fires were at their pink of perfection a battleship chose to get up her anchor by hand delaying us an hour and blackening the well-cherished furnaces number two welsh this must have been an admiralty jest needs a lot of coaxing chimney sweeps on the high seas but we were not quite such an exhibition as the arrogant she showed like chemical works in full blast as we swept out of bantry and headed south for the sillies then up came the blake see note six a beautiful boat giving easily to the swell that was lifting us already and she dodged about left and right till we asked what are you trying to do trying to get out of your smoke said she vomiting cascades of her own the while meantime the fleet rams were doing their best to blind and poison us and the battleships sagged away to leeward looking like wet ricks ablaze it was not the ignominy of the thing the mere dirt and filth that annoyed one so much as the thought that there was no power in the state which owes its existence to the navy whereby a decent supply of state-owned state-dug coal could be assured to us there had been a strike and while masters and men were argle-bargling ashore her majesty's ships were masquerading in the guise of chimney-sweeps on the high seas the delay the disorder the cruel extra work on stokers not to mention the engineers who at all times are worked pitilessly is in peace no more than merely brutal in war it would be dangerous four hours at full speed as if that were not enough the swell that the battleships logged as light heaven forgive them began to heave our starboard screw out of the water we raced and we raced and we raced dizzily thunderously paralytically hysterically vibrating all down one side it was of course in our four hours of full speed that the sea most delighted to lift us up one finger and watch us kick from six to ten p m one screw twizzled for the most part in the circambient ether and the chief engineer with coal dust and oil driven under his skin volunteered the information that life in his department was gay he would have left a white mark on the assistant engineer whose work lay in the stokehold among a gang of new irish stokers never but once have i been in our engine rooms and i do not go again till i can take with me their designer for four hours at full speed the place is a little cramped and close as you might say a steel guard designed to protect men from a certain toothed wheel round the shaft shore through its bolts and sat down much as a mudguard sits down on a bicycle wheel but the wheel it sat on was also of steel spinning one hundred and ninety revolutions per minute so there were fireworks beautiful but embarrassing of incandescent steel sparks surrounding the assistant engineer as with an aurora borealis they turned the hose on the display and at last knocked the guard sideways and it fell down somewhere under the shaft so that they were at liberty to devote their attention to the starboard thrust block which was a trifle loose indeed they had been trying to wedge the ladder when the fireworks began all up their backs the thing that consoled them was the thought that they had not slowed down one single turn the naval engineer she's a giddy little thing said the chief engineer come down and have a look 
i declined in suitable language some day when i know more i will write about engine rooms and stokers accommodations the manners and customs of naval engineers and their artificers they are an amazing breed these quiet rather pale men in whose hands lie the strength and power of the ship just think what they've got to stand up to says twenty one with the beautiful justice of youth of course they are trained at Cam and all that but fancy doing your work with an eight-inch steam-pipe in the nape of your neck and a dynamo buzzing up your back and the whole blessed chute whizzin round in the pit of your stomach then we jump about and curse if they don't give us enough steam i swear i think they're no end good men in the engine-room if you doubt this descend by the slippery steel ladders into the bluish copper-smelling haze of hurrying mechanism all crowded under the protective deck crawl along the greasy foot-plates and stand with your back against the lengthwise bulkhead that separates the desperately whirling twin engines wait under the low-browed supporting columns till the roar and the quiver has soaked into every nerve of you till your knees loosen and your heart begins to pump feel the floors lift below you to the jar and batter of the defrauded propeller as it draws out of its element try now to read the dizzying gauge needles or find a meaning in the rumbled signals from the bridge creep into the stokehold a boiler blistering either ear as you stoop and taste what tinned air is like for a while face the intolerable white glare of the opened furnace doors get into a bunker and see how they pass coal along and up and down stand for five minutes with slice and devil to such labour as the stoker endures for four hours his hourly risk the gentleman with the little velvet slip between the gold rings on his sleeve does his unnoticed work among these things if anything goes wrong if he overlooks a subordinate's error he will not be wigged by the admiral in god's open air the bill will be presented to him down here under the two-inch steel deck by the power he has failed to control he will be peeled flayed blinded or boiled that is his hourly risk his duty shifts him from one ship to another to good smooth and accessible engines to vicious ones with a long record of deviltry to lying engines that cannot do their work to impostors with mysterious heart-breaking weaknesses to new and untried gear fresh from the contractor's hands to boilers that will not make steam to reducing valves that will not reduce and auxiliary engines for distilling or lighting that often give more trouble than the main concern he must shift his methods for and project himself into the soul of each humouring adjusting bullying coaxing refraining risking and daring as need arises behind him is his own honour and reputation the honour of his ship and her imperious demands for there is no excuse in the navy if he fails in any one particular he severs just one nerve of the ship's life if he fails in all the ship dies a prisoner to the set of the sea a gift to the nearest enemy and as i have seen him he is infinitely patient resourceful and unhurried however it might have been in the old days when men clung obstinately to sticks and strings and cloths the newer generation bred to pole masts know that he is the kingpin of their system our assistant engineer had been with the engines from the beginning and one night he told me their story utterly unconscious that there was anything out of the way in the noble little tale no end good men it was his business so to arrange that no single demand from the bridge should go unfulfilled for more than five seconds to that ideal he toiled unsparingly with his chief a black sweating demon in his working hours and a quiet student of professional papers in his scanty leisure and they come into the wardroom says twenty one and you know they've been having a young hell of a time down below but they never growl at us or get stuffy or anything no end good men i swear they are
notes for a fleet in being by rudyard kipling this librivox recording is in the public domain note one paint and gilding a ship who attempted to dress on her service allowance of paint would in three months be as disreputable as a battery or regiment which kept its mess or band on the strict army footing therefore over and above anything that they may secure by strategy and foresight the officers must dip into their own pockets to supply the many trifles none of them cheap which make for the smartness of a ship this was forcibly brought home to me when i admired a shield and scroll work at the bows of a large cruiser yes said a friend it takes about fifty books of gold leaf to gild that decently no seventy said another how'd you know well somebody's got to gild it and the yard don't give you seventy books for nothing was the significant reply if there were any means of reckoning the taxpayer would be somewhat astonished at the sums spent by navy and army for the privilege of serving the queen both services have curious and crusted tales bearing on this head note one a as the comfort and efficiency of the ship not to mention the captain's peace of mind depend on the first lieutenant the captain as a rule takes good care to pick his own man here are a few of the first lieutenant's duties he must act as a strainer between the captain and the ship holding back the unessential passing on the vital that is to say he must be a subtle and discriminating editor he must make all his arrangements for the ordering and disposition of every soul aboard through the next day week or month with the cheerful foreknowledge that the bulk of them will be knocked into a naval cocked hat by the exigencies of the service he must then retire into himself with a pack of printed cards one for each man and work out the whole puzzle afresh at the same time he must not allow his own irritation to affect his dealings with the wardroom whose official head he is and whose members are a his subordinates and b gentlemen of leisure assembled of an evening for a quiet rubber he must get the utmost out of them not by the menace of his authority because that means a smash-up sooner or later but because of their genuine liking for him as an individual the wardroom is young very male and unable to avoid meeting itself every day and all day long you will concede that a certain amount of tact may be necessary in handling it he must further see with those eyes which he is authorized to wear at the back of his head that no warrant or petty officer no ship's corporal or master-at-arms is abusing authority to spite some man or boy he must still further see that no official yielding to a natural desire for popularity is quietly letting down the discipline of the lower deck he must know the captain's mind seventeen and two-thirds seconds before the captain opens his mouth because he will need that time to think out arrangements to meet the order he must be the soul of rectitude and honour but he must grasp the inwardness and frustrate the outwardness of every trick and trap sprung on him twenty times a day in the captain's absence he is the visitor's host and chaperone and as visitors in harbour may range from royalty to ragamuffins his manners must be in the widest sense of the word adaptable finally at all crises where the blue goes there must he lead leaping the larger abyss standing nearer to the danger walking the more slippery foothold passively enduring longer the exposure and through it all he must keep the cool eye and balanced head of authority and the public is surprised when a naval officer proves that he is a diplomat note two coxswains and galleys the captain's coxswain is always an important person as a rule the captain has known him for a long time 
often for ten or fifteen years and the man follows his superior's fortunes with unswerving loyalty till he blossoms into the dignity of coxswain of the admiral's barge beside whom dukes are not even three a penny he is by virtue of his office the smartest man on the ship and by training becomes a clean-shaved miracle of tact and discretion each boat's crew have a life of their own a little world into which they enter picking up where they left off so soon as cutter or whaler leaves the ship's side but i fancy the esprit de corps is most strongly developed in the captain's galley on one occasion we had been out all day fishing and the wind forced us to row the long seven miles back to the fleet against the tide round rocky points fringed with conflicting currents it was a lumpy and disheartening sea leaden grey in the twilight except where the shoals cast up wisps and smudges of half phosphorescent white a three hours journey enlivened by the incessant dry roar and rattle of the surf around roncarrig and the answering growl of the waves on the mainland i watched the untiring machine digging out over the steep pitched cross waters eight pair of shoulders rising and falling against the first stars and the smoke of spray about the bows till every muscle in me ached out of sympathy thrice they were invited to rest themselves for they had been ten hours at work and there was six hundred pounds dead weight of fish in the boat and thrice they replied oh we can jog on like this sir so they jogged with never a quiver or a falter through all the tumble and when we reached stillwater under the lee of the ships they spurted up the avenue as though returning from a call on the flagship half a mile away i demanded of the coxswain how this thing was done oh you get used to it said he besides that wasn't anything particular sometimes you have the boat half full of water jumping out and coming down like a hammer that's the time you learn to row i see why didn't some of you miss your stroke in that tumble coming around the point when we took the water over the bows well still the same smile if you did that why you wouldn't be in the galley there's all the other boats to practise that in you've never seen her properly under sail have you for sheer luxury of motion commend me to a galley which has just taken on a brother captain's craft for a small walk down the bay the rig is simplicity itself there is a man to every rope that vitally communicates with anything and the most highly trained shifting ballast in the world spread low between the thwarts obeys the wave of the hand note three the art of gunnery many men will tell you that our ships are undergunned and so they are on paper but on paper a gun merely represents a tube sticking out of the side one does not see the little group of from three to nine men who work it in action the ammunition hoist that feeds it or the pile of live shell and cartridge that would lie beside it these things take up space and the more space you supply the less will the gun be disconcerted by its own or a neighbor's disaster our people do not like to work in crowds they prefer as we do ashore to manage their own little shows alone the effect of wounded men kicking and hiccuping in a crowded secondary battery is bad for cool aiming besides which idlers cooks and servants might be jostling the workers in their efforts to get the wounded below on an open deck with fair intervals between the guns the wounded can be moved out of the way at once and if the gun itself by any chance be dismounted there is a margin of safety for its inboard collapse and room for a working party to take charge of it i am speaking now of light armaments behind shields the knowledge that one lucky shot might wreck two or three guns together does not make for happiness this is why our guns are comparatively few in number but exceedingly handy to work 
a ship knows of course exactly where the crowd would of necessity be gathered in any craft opposed to her two or three shots in a nest of crowded guns open ammunition hoists and piles of ready cartridges will do more moral and intellectual damage than the effacement of one or two guns in a line strung evenly from bow to stern note four omdurman you must understand here that the flagship was not only our central authority but reuters agency as well and that between orders for drills were sandwiched little pieces of news from the world ashore one peaceful morning the yeoman of signals came to the captain's cabin at the regulation pace but with heightened colour and an eye something brighter than usual signal from the flagship sir said he reading off the slate omdurman fallen killed so many and wounded so many thank you said the captain tell the men on this i went forward to see how the news would be received we were busy painting some deck houses and the work continued to an accompaniment of subdued voices the hushed tones of men under the eye of authority word was passed to the lower deck in the stokehold and the hum of talk rose perhaps half a note i halted by the painters said one dipping deep in the white lead mm, ah this ought to make the french sickish almost ear em coughin can't you said another reaching out for the broadest and slabbiest brush i say alf lend us that cartoon brush o yours after a long pause stepping back to catch the effect of a peculiarly juicy stroke head a little aside and one eye shut well we've waited about long enough haven't we bosun's mate with a fine mixture of official severity and human tolerance what are you cacklin for over there carry on quiet can't you and that was how we took the news of the little skirmish called omdurman note five boat racing our whaler would go out between lights under pretence of practising but really for the purpose of insulting other whalers whom she had beaten in intership contests boat racing is to the mariner what horse racing is to the landsman the way of it is simple when your racing crew is in proper condition you row under the bows of the ship you wish to challenge and throw up an oar if you are very confident or have a long string of victories to your credit you borrow a cock from the hen coops and make him crow then the match arranges itself a friendly launch tows both of you a couple of miles down the bay and back you come digging out for the dear life to be welcomed by hoarse subdued roars from the crowded forecastles of the battleships this deep booming surge of voices is most moving to hear some day a waiting fleet will thus cheer a bruised and battered sister staggering in with a prize at her tail a plugged and splintered wreck of an iron box her planking brown with what has dried there and the bright water cascading down her sides i saw the setting of such a picture one blood-red evening when the hulls of the fleet showed black in olive-green water and the yellow of the masts turned raw meat colours in the last light a couple of racing cutters spun down the fairway and long after they had disappeared we could hear far-off ships applauding them it was too dark to catch more than a movement of masses by the bows and it seemed as though the ships themselves were triumphing altogether note six the beauty of battleships do not believe what people tell you of the ugliness of steam nor join those who lament the old sailing days there is one beauty of the sun and another of the moon and we must be thankful for both a modern man-of-war photographed in severe profile is not engaging but you should see her with the life hot in her head on across a heavy swell the ram bow draws upward and outward in a stately sweep there is no ruck of figurehead bow timbers or bowsprit fittings to distract the eye from its outline or the beautiful curves that mark its melting into the full bosom of the ship 
it hangs dripping an instant and then quietly and cleanly as a tempered knife slices into the hollow of the swell down and down till the surprised sea spits off in foam about the hawse holes as the ship rolls in her descent you can watch curve after new curve revealed humouring and coaxing the water when she recovers her step the long sucking hollow of her own wave discloses just enough of her shape to make you wish to see more in harbour the still water-line hard as the collar of a tailor-made jacket hides that vision but when she dances the big sea dance she is as different from her portsmouth shilling photograph as is a matron in a mackintosh from the same lady at a ball swaying a little in her gait drunk with sheer delight of movement perfectly apt for the work at hand and in every line of her rejoicing that she is doing it she shows to these eyes at least a miracle of grace and beauty her sides are smooth as a water-worn pebble curved and moulded as the sea loves to have them where the box sponsioned overhanging treble turreted ships of some other navies hammer and batter into an element they do not understand she clean cool and sweet uses it to her own advantage the days are over for us when men piled baronial keeps flat-irons candlesticks and doré towers on floating platforms the new navy offers to the sea precisely as much to take hold of as the trim level-headed woman with generations of inherited experience offers to society it is the provincial aggressive uncompromising angular full of excellently unpractical ideas who is hurt and jarred and rasped in that whirl in other words she is not a good sea-boat and